I think I find the, the visual nature of, of small rivers so much more exciting than their, than their bigger cousins, really. It's, um, yeah, being able to see fish uh, kind of in the natural environment, sometimes get fish feeding and kind of watch their reaction to rigs and bait, that, that, that's really exciting, I think. Um, I just find it more of an adventure, I guess. You know, it, you're kind of sort of fighting through the brambles, the stinging nettles. It's, it's like being a kid again, I guess. And, you know, I think it's easy, it's easy to associate, you know, big, big fish with big rivers, but that, that isn't the case. You know, some of the smallest rivers in England actually hold some of the biggest, biggest barbel and chub. So there are some fantastic rewards on offer, you know, when fishing small rivers. And I just find extracting big fish from these kind of sort of jungle environments just so much more rewarding. Fish in small rivers, um, like the River Nee and the River Lee and, and loads of other smaller rivers around the country, uh, they, they, they differ from the fish in the, in the bigger rivers like the Wye, the Trent and the Thames, uh, mainly because I think they're far less forgiving of anglers' mistakes. Um, you can very easily ruin a swim uh, by creating too much disturbance early on. Almost always, even if I know the venue really well, I'll always go for a look um, and a good walk along the river before I even get any gear out of the car because, you know, venues can change very quickly and you, know, you might find fish in a different area, a completely different swim. So it's always worth having a really good look. Um, you know, obviously wear Polaroids um, and a baseball cap if it's sunny, you know, and look for fish. You know, you need, ultimately, it's the same as any venue, but you need to find the fish and that's, and that's no more so important than when you're fishing these quite low stocked um, small rivers because you know you can find most of the fish in the whole stretch tucked in one tiny snag um, and yeah if you don't locate them first at the end of the day you're not going to catch them. On these kind of smaller venues I try and stay mobile generally so I take uh, minimal kit that normally involves you know one rod Ne never two rods. You see, I see a lot of people trying to fish with two rods on a small river and frankly I think it, it does you more harm than good. So one rod, um, a, a good sized landing net, rucksack, small unhooking mat and a, and a bucket of bait. That is pretty much all I'll take um, for a session. So it's, um, yeah, stay mobile, take minimal kit and, and really use your eyes and look. So first of all, I'll always try and visually locate fish. You know, like I said, on, on some of these smaller venues, you can often spot fish, but if it's too coloured or if there's a lot of vegetation, a lot of weed growth, sometimes they can be quite hard to find. In, and in those kind of cases, I generally look for, for snaggy areas. Often on a stretch, you'll find one or two sort of big sets of snags, and, and they could well hold the bulk of the fish population. You know, they may hold um, you know, dozens of barbel and chub in each one. And so that would always be the starting point, particularly if you're going to fish during the day as well. You know, on hot summer days, a lot of the fish population will probably spend most of that time tucked under dense vegetation and dense snag. So fishing, fishing close to those kind of areas is, is always a pretty safe bet. Depending on how well I know the venue, I'll probably look to, to bait and fish maybe up to sort of three swims in a, in a day. Um, I've, I've baited more than that in the past, but rarely do you end up getting the time to actually fish more than that properly. So yeah, two to three swims, um, baiting them first, like I said, take a walk just with a bucket of bait and your Polaroids, bait some areas, and then, um, and then you can fish them in rotation. And what you can often do is maybe try and extract a fish from one and then move on to another. Um, because you cause a bit of disturbance in the first. So yeah, two to three swims in a day is, is ample. And I'd probably be looking to fish up to two or three hours in each before, before moving on.
So a lot of my barbel fishing in particular now in the summer um, and chub fishing in the winter actually come to think of it revolves around boiling and, and pellet fishing now. Um, I still occasionally use things like hemp but it, these days it certainly seems like, like boilies and, and, and pellets um, like the dynamite big fish river range, dynamite sauce, complex tea, you know those kind of sort of fish meal um, baits with a, a really strong aroma really are the kind of king on, on, on the river these days as far as I'm concerned and I you know I, I rarely use anything else. How I'd go about Baiting each swim would probably depend on its on its kind of nature, really. You know, if it was quite a pacey swim um, with quite a lot of flow or particularly deep, I'd probably use a bait dropper. Um, whereas on kind of slower, shallower swims, you can often just bait freely by hand, and, and you know, you can watch the bait falling through the water to make sure it's landing in the right place. Um, as I said, you know, a lot of these venues are quite low stocked, so it's, it's best to fish for bites, really. You know, on the on the bigger rivers, you can get away with putting in a lot of bait early on trying to draw numbers of fish in but actually on these smaller rivers you know you are fishing for for one or two fish um, in one area at a time often so it's best to, to bait minimal I find you know small PVA bags with pellets um, broken boilies maybe a few a few pellets trickled in beforehand um, as I said fish for bites you know if you, if you get action you can obviously feed more and try and build the swim but but primarily you know fish for that first bite initially and then see how the session pans out. So if I'm baiting by hand, I tend to stick with, with boilies and pellets because they, they, they sink a lot faster through the water than, than smaller particles. Um, and you can bait much more accurately using those. But if I'm using a bait dropper, I'll often add quite a lot more hemp to the mix. So I'll, I'll combine things like, um, like hemp, micro pellets, um, uh, you know, mixed pellets like the Big Fish River range are really good for a bait dropper because you can ensure they're all going to get to the bottom at the same time um, and in the same area. So yeah, generally, generally I'll be bait dropping a mixture of hemp small pellets and broken boilies. Just like when you're carp fishing or fishing still waters for other species, I think if you can combine a load of different sized food items in the same swim that can really keep the fish interested for a lot longer. Um, I use a lot of, of micro pellets in my mix, so I use two mils, three mils, um, all the way up to eight mil pellets, so there's loads of different food items. So I find micro halibut pellets particularly effective. Um, I said the dynamite marine halibuts are, are fantastic for barbel. You know, barbel love fish meal pellets, and uh, the dynamite marine halibuts have really high oil. So particularly for summer and autumn fishing, they're absolutely perfect. And I think, particularly with hemp as well, they can all kind of they, they, they get you know stuck in the in the gravel in the little gaps between the stones, and that really keeps things like barbel grubbing around for a lot longer. So if you combine smaller food items and loads of them, then you can hold the fish in the swim and, and keep them feeding. When a lot of anglers think about small rivers and kind of intimate venues, they think of sort of more traditional light tackle fishing, you know, Avon rods, um, centre pins, maybe, you know, quite, quite light balanced gear. Now that's all well and good, but often, as I mentioned earlier, you are still fishing for some big, big fish in these small venues, and you need to fish appropriate gear to land them. Um, as I said, often you're fishing quite close to snags, and you need to be able to extract, you know, big, powerful barbel from underneath, underneath trees. So I fish quite heavy, heavy gear. I mean, today, for instance, I'm fishing a, a, a 2.25 pound uh, barbel rod with a, with a straight tip. I, I, I don't really bother with, with quiver tips when barbel fishing, not on small venues. Um, fishing sort of 12 to 15 pound main line, depending on how snaggy the swim might be. When it comes to the end tackle, I find a slightly more refined approach is better on these small venues. I often fish a, a straight lead, a running lead, um, no leader of any of any nature. Um, so a running lead straight through to a to a fairly short hook link. Actually, um, again, a lot of barbel anglers think about using long hook links. You know, anything from three, four, up to even six feet at times. And again, that works well on the bigger rivers, but it's just quite cumbersome to fish. As I said, you're often trying to put baits in very tight, snaggy areas, and, and trying to do that with a long hook link is very difficult. So, and again, fishing a couple of small boilies on the hair generally. What I will always, always do with a small, uh, short hook link is use a back lead, though I think that, that is really important. And it's, a, it's one of the mistakes I see a lot of barbel anglers as doing. You know, they, they often 
they often keep the tips up in the air, keep the line angle quite high, um, and that's the last thing you want to do. You know, keep keep the rod tips down, keep your line angle low, and ideally use a back lead and keep everything pinned down because the last thing you want is is barbell and chart rushing into the line and spooking when you spend you know hours trying to get them feeding and prepping a swim. So um, yeah, that's my general approach. So fish care is paramount, particularly when, when fishing for barbel and char. You know, they, they fight extremely hard um, and oxygen levels can often be low at this time of year. So it's really, you know, the angler's responsibility to do the best to look after the fish that they catch and they hook. You know, part of it comes down to using appropriate tackle. You know, you, you want to be able to play fish in fairly quickly. Um, and that's why I, I, you know, I fish a very tight clutch. I tend to play barbel and char hard because as I said, one, you're fishing snaggy areas, but two, you want to get them in with, with minimal, minimal fuss. Um, I mentioned earlier, really important, important to carry a hook, unhooking mat. Um, always wet that, obviously, before you, before you lay the fish on it. Um, and use a large landing net, you know, at least 30 inches. I use a 30 inch pan net, because I find it's much easier to maneuver in the flow than a, than a triangle, uh, a triangular mesh net. Um, so yeah, play them hard. You know, land them, keep them in a, in a you know a deeply mesh net in the margins where you prep all your unhooking, unhooking equipment. Make sure everything's wet, and, and most importantly, make sure they recover appropriately as well. You know, it's very easy for them to get exhausted during the fight, and I think a lot of anglers release barbel and chop. You know, they look like they go off fine, but you know they, they can take a while to recover. So, you know, hold them in the net before you release them until they look like they're absolutely recovered. <laughs> 